Hi, everyone. I'm Anthony Ruggiano, and I want to welcome everybody to Reformed Gangsters, and I, I, and I want to thank Scarlet's Alibi for the music intro. Um, I hope everybody enjoys it. Got it. Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Ruggiano, and in 1988, I was struggling with addiction, and I went into a treatment center. I set up a helpline number, which is 855-963-2113. That's 855-963-2113. That number, phones will be manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're struggling with addiction, or you know someone that is struggling with addiction, please call that number and let me help. I will be hands-on. I will be personally involved in the person's recovery. They will meet me. They will spend time with me. And I will help them live a life beyond their wildest dreams. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Ruggiano, and I want to welcome everybody to Reform Gangsters with my special guest, my good friend, Hollywood Wade. How you doing? Good to see you again, right, my good friend. Good to see you, too. All right, well, another episode <laughs> of Behind the Gangster here. Yeah, here we We've go. We've done two on Goodfellas. We've done one on the Gotti movie. We're going to keep on with the Gottis, and we're going to go with Paul Castellano, because to me personally, he's a very interesting guy. I know a, not well respected as far as from the streets, but had good business sense, great business mm -hmm. sense. Um, so we're going to do him here today on Behind the Gangster. And I guess we'll start off, you know, he was a, a street guy. He did take, uh, kind of like Jimmy Burke, and we've talked about in our past episode, he did take a pinch early, got out, didn't say nothing, which kind of boosted his rep in the street. But he really kind of really got tied in when he married, was Carlo Gambino's sister-in-law? Is that what well, it was? Well, originally, no, they were, no, they were first cousins. So he was always tied in with the mob through the, the Gambinos and the Castellanos were first cousins, so he married Carlo Gambino's sister, who was his first cousin, and Carlo Gambino married Paul Castellano's sister, who was his first cousin, so they were always all tied in, but his father was a butcher. Okay. And he was a butcher when he was a kid. They actually invented, from what I understand, the chicken cutlet. <laughs> really? Mean, yeah, that's what I, like, they had, like, my father told me they had, like, the chicken cutlets with Ed's. I mean, they had a big uh, produce business. Hmm. Now, one thing I'll say is Paul, from everything that I've read and researched, he did have a great mind for business. Mm -hmm. uh, would, what was your personal relationship with Paul? You know, any chance meeting you have with him? Could you pick up on that? Or yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. He was a businessman. He wasn't really. He wasn't a street guy, really. Right. He wasn't a gangster. He was dangerous and he was a killer. He was, you know, he was a businessman. He always owned business. Very well, you know, educated. Uh, respected. Uh, I had a couple of incidents with him. I mean, the first time I personally met him was at my wedding in 1977 when I married my wife Alice. He came to my wedding. He gave me, as a matter of fact, he gave me a, a wedding card with $500 in it, which was a lot of money in 1977. Uh, and he signed it. I remember we were in my basement the next day looking at all the envelopes and I cut open this envelope and, I, and the money came out and it said on it, love Paul Castellano. And my father grabbed the car and ripped it up and threw it out. Like, I wish I could have still had it. I probably could have sold it on eBay or oh, something. Oh, I bet you could I mean, he signed it like, Paul Cast love Paul Castellano. And my father ripped it up and threw it out the card. And that was the first time I met him. The second time I met him was, um, unfortunately, when one of my brother's friends was murdered in 88th Street Park. Um, we had a sit-down in Brooklyn in Jimmy Brown's club. And he was there at the sit-down. And I met him that time. And... Um, I was at Neil's funeral when he didn't show up. I remember that day they were yeah. all talking about it. He didn't show up. So I had a couple of incidents with him. My father was close with him. My father did business with him because my father ran the um, Tapers Union, which was the sheetrock union mm -hmm. for the Gambino family. And Paul was big in, in construction. Right. So my father had meetings with him. Tony Lee, my father's partner, hated him. 
because he uh, he he uh, he uh, not abused Tony, but he he had a, he belittled Tony Lee one night over when my father was in prison. Tony Lee took over the union, and he really never ran the union. He didn't really know much about the union, and Paul sent for Tony Lee, and Tony Lee didn't really have the answers for him because my father ran the union, and Tony Lee said, "Listen, Andy ran the union, not me." And Paul sort of like yelled at him, I guess you could say. So Paul, Tony Lee never had no use for him, but nobody liked him. Everybody, nobody talked good about him. Well, I mean, why do you think Carlo put him as boss when he passed away? Because we've talked, you know, in past episodes of these shows, everyone probably felt and, and thought that it should have been Neil. Why do you think he did put Big Paul in that spot? I think because they were first cousins. I think it was had, had to do with the bloodline. It had to do with how that frame of thought. They thought they were royalty. And I think Carl knew Neil was old school, and I think Carl knew Neil would abide by what Carl's asked. Mm -hmm. Because of Carl, like we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, about you know the boss is the boss, and I think because they were related, and I think he knew that Neil wouldn't you know wouldn't go against him and would wow. would would go by. Because realistically, everybody thought our Neil was going to become the boss. I mean, I know my father told me a hundred times that they all got mad with Neil. They all got like John, my father, Tony Lee, all of them got upset that Neil didn't become the boss because mm -hmm. they just thought it was a given. Now, when he became boss, I mean, didn't he start putting higher taxes on people? I think he raised like a 15% tax on Yeah, but when he first everything. became the boss, too, he gave, he was, he had, you know, he had a lot of money. When he first became the boss to appease everybody, to be f friends with everybody, he was giving out $100,000 loans for a point to any made member of his family that wanted a $100,000 loan. He would give it to them for 1% which was really giving yeah. it to them for free. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? So that was that one. I even know a couple of guys that took it, that took the 100000 and put it in the street. I mean, they didn't yeah. beat them. Right. They put it in the street and they earned money with it. I mean, if yeah. I was a wise guy, I would have took it. I mean, uh, but yeah, then he raised the, you know, he raised everything. He was money hungry. He was an octopus. You know, it was all about money. But one thing he did do, because he wasn't greedy to a point, because when, with the tapers union, my father was taking my father was taking care of her for Gambino. He was only getting like two thousand a month. When Paul became the boss and my father met with them, Paul asked my father how much he was getting, and my father told him. Paul said, "That's all you get," and Paul made it more, gave mm -hmm. my father more than Carl gave him. He also dealt a lot with uh, Roy DeMeo and their their auto scam. And when when that kind of came to a head. DeMeo had an idea that uh, he was probably going to get clipped. I think I've seen an interview with his son where he told his son pretty much like, hey, I'm going to get killed. And Paul set that up, and I think Nino Gaggi was the trigger man on that, if, I'm, if I got my name right. No. Well, what happened was Nino, Nino Gaggi was probably one of Paul's main captains, Nino and, and Tommy Bellotti, of course. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, so, um, well, Sammy the Bull talks about this a lot. As a matter of fact, Sammy just did a, a thing on that, that the hit first went, this is according to what Sammy the Bull said, the hit went first to John. And John passed. John passed. Then the hit went to Frankie DeChico. Frankie DeChico, what it was supposed to be, the three of them was supposed to be the Gemini twins and Roy DeMeo. The three of them were supposed to get, the contract that first was on the three of them to kill the three through Nino Gaggi. Then it, the hit went to Frankie DeChico, Frankie DeChico went to the Gemini twins and told them if they clipped Roy DeMeo, he could get the contract on them squashed. And he did that. They clipped Roy, and then they got squashed, and then they clipped Nino Gaggi. Then Paul had Nino Gaggi killed. So Paul was treacherous. I mean, he was a yeah. Sicilian guy. He was treacherous. And that's what I wanted to bring to light, because he's often looked at this, you know, white collar businessman but he was ruthless in the sense that he might not have been the guy holding the gun but he had a ruthless. lot of triggers pulled under his watch and his plenty of order. people got killed because of him on his word plenty of people he was ruthless just like the chin was ruthless i mean all of them you had to be ruthless to become a boy even i mean he became a boss because of carl but right. he was but to, to hold on to it he had listen he was going to kill john Gotti. that was actually the next thing i yeah. was going to get I into mean, when yeah. those tapes were yeah. were made Neil was trying to buffer that out and not give him them tapes, but sooner or later he was going to get those he tapes. Had, listen, once he sent, for, and I say this over and over again, once he sent for those tapes 
and they told him no, someone was going to get killed. And if they did give him the tapes, someone was going to get killed. So if John sacrificed Angelo or his brother, which he would have never done because John was a gangster, but someone was going to die over those tapes. Mm -hmm. And the rumor in the street was, I mean, I even heard the rumor that the rumor was that if they were going to do something after Christmas, and John did it before Christmas. John was a gangster, you know, and John knew that someone had to die. I mean, once the tapes, were, once he wanted those tapes, that was it. Yeah, and Paul had already been arrested, and he made bail on the auto. Uh, right. And he was, was on the commission on. case. He was on yeah. two cases. So he had the two cases later on with the commission. So Paul wasn't exactly sitting pretty himself. No, he was probably going to go to going. jail. I mean, yeah. the commission case, they all went to jail. Yeah, everybody went to jail. So, yeah. I mean, had he lived, I'm pretty sure he would have went to went yeah. to jail anyway. But there were some other things that started to come out about Paul. Obviously, people know that he was having uh, an affair, I think, with his maid. <laughs> right. And uh, due to some health complications, he couldn't... Uh, he had a rod. Yeah, yeah he, couldn't perform you, in, in and, certain and ways. And if you listen to the... And <laughs> even in the movie, or, and if you listen to the agents, and in some of these movies, when he found out his house was bugged, he was upset because now the they truth knew. was going to come out about his sexual functions and the maid and his wife found out and his kids found out that he was having an affair. He was, a, according to what you read and what you hear, he was crazy about this woman. Yeah. And like you said, he paid to have some sort of implant to yeah. help him out. And that did get leaked out and got right. around to the light. That couldn't have been a good look. No, not for the boss. <laughs> I mean, no, not definitely, not, definitely not for the boss. No, no, that was not good. Now, you, you mentioned earlier he does go in on the commission case. Um, you know, did he think Roy would have flipped because the Roy case happened before the commission. Killing Roy, Roy killed a lot of people. I mean, anybody who's ever read that book, well, I think it's Murder Machine. Yeah. I mean, they killed a lot of people in the Gemini Lounge. Mm. Did he think Roy was going to flip? Do you think that would have been a possibility? I don't think so. I think he just thought, you know, Roy was just a psychopath, a serial killer, and, and he had to go. I think Nino Gaggi got killed because he figured he could beat the case. With Nino out of the picture, with Roy DeMeo out of the picture, it would make it easier for him to beat that case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of, I mean, you got to understand, the mafia is a treacherous life. I mean, years ago, even to backtrack, this guy Tony Plate, he was on uh, Neil Delacroix's co defendant. He blatantly got killed because without him on the case, Neil, they dismissed the charges on Neil. He did nothing wrong except get arrested with on Neil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just treachery. So now here's a guy, he's the boss, he's on trial with, Roy DeMeo and Nino Gaggi, and they both got killed. You know, I don't think Paul knew he was going to get killed. He just wanted to beat the right. case. Well, and that's the thing is, I think he was, made, like you said, basically just eliminating anybody that stood any of chance of him going to jail. But I think at the same time, John had to be sitting back and saying, look, this is my shot. He's on, on the commission case. You know, he's took out people here, took out people here. If he gets these tapes... I'm probably dead. My brother's probably dead. Angelo Ruggiero is probably dead. So that was the time to to make his move. And I think probably when Neil died, you know, him no showing that funeral was, that was a big the end deal. Of it. Yeah, that was that was the now end of it. now John had ammunition to go to people. Go, look, this guy disrespected me. Yeah, exactly. Now John had ammunition to go to people and say, listen, this guy's got to go. He disrespected Neil. He just did, you know. But Angelo, nobody talks about. Angelo Quack is Quack Quack. Angelo Jerry is really the guy that put that together. He made John the boss. Mm -hmm. He doesn't never gets credit for what he did because of them tapes, because of him blabbering on all those tapes. But he was the guy that put it together. He was the guy that went around and put it together for John mm -hmm. Angelo, because he, you know, he was very well liked and very well respected and very dangerous. He was very tight with my father, too. He used to tell my father everything. But uh, that's another story for another day. But uh, So he put it all together for, for, for John. Now, there's a, often been a lot. You talked about when his house got bugged. They pretended to have some uh, wiring issues, and the agent went in and was able to cable put a issues. bug in his Yeah, cable issues and put a bug in his house. Did Had you ever went to that White House up there? They said that was a massive house. No, I, nev house. I never went to his house out there. No, Tony, not, I never personally went to it, no. No, okay. But I yeah. remember when he moved out there. I remember when he moved out of the neighborhood and he moved there. Yeah, yeah. that was a it was a big house. The yeah. pictures that I've seen, that was a and pretty after he house got after he there. got arrested, I remember he used to drive around in a van. He used to have this kid drive, and he used to hide in the back of the van, and he would pull up in front of Cafe Liberty, and Tony Lee would get in the van, and he would be sitting in the back of the van, and they would drive around the neighborhood and talk 
in the, you know, you couldn't see in the van. It was a, like a rented van, and he would hide in the back of the van, Angelo, <laughs> and chain smoke Marlboros. And of course, the poor guy died of lung cancer because he's, every time you saw him, he had a cigarette in his mouth. Well, we mentioned earlier that had the with the commission case on the rise, nobody else made it out of it, so Paul probably wouldn't either. Hypothetically, if that wasn't going on, where do you think Paul would have took the family, you know, going forward? Say John did not kill him, the commission case wasn't going on. Do you think the Gambinos could have prospered under Paul? Because all things considered, he, he, if he could have drove them into – using the mob's fear to gain all these construction contracts. I do think there could have been some, some progress with that. Although he wasn't very liked, I do think he had the mindset to put them into ways to make more money and then get into more legitimate businesses. Where do you think that could have landed? Yeah, I mean, if there was no tapes and there was no friction, yeah, I think he would have took them. They would have all, eventually, they would have made money. Eventually, it would have trickled down because he was a sharp businessman. He was intelligent. And he was he was about earning money. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, it definitely would have it would have thrived. It would have thrived. I mean, they were so big, and like you said, with the construction, it would have definitely thrived if things would have fell into place differently than they did. But you got to understand too, there was a lot of stuff going on on the down low with the drugs, mm -hmm. and and you know he didn't. So there was a. I, Eventually, something may have jumped off because of all the stuff that was going on under the table, you know what I mean, with the drugs and everything, right. and with the hoodlums in the street, because he was not a hoodlum. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they were, if, if everything, if all the cards would have fell, fell right, yeah, they would have thrived. I mean, there was, people made money with him. My father made money with him. I mean, people made money with him. Well, the cards fell one night at Spark Steakhouse Without for him. Without unfortunately. And who, who was he supposed to be meeting that night? Frankie DeChico. That he was his guy. That Frankie the Chico blatantly set him up. I mean, he he definitely is the Judas. I mean, they, people say John John's not the Judas. John it was kill or be killed. Mm -hmm. Frankie the Chico, who I liked, who I knew, he was coming there to meet Frankie. Frankie was one of his main guys. Mm -hmm. So Frankie the Chico definitely. I mean, I heard from people that when he got out of the car, he went to like literally shake the hands of the people that shot him. Like he saw them and like actually was going to say hello to them and they blasted him like that's wow. how you know because there's been reports that uh people were in trench coats like Russian yeah but trench he, coats he yeah but you know he's he had they were right there yeah. and that's just that's the gossip that you know he yeah. he was going to actually like say hello to them when they blasted him now i wasn't this was fairly it wasn't late at night it was kind of no, in the it was, afternoon it was mid afternoon yeah late afternoon yeah yeah late afternoon it was snowing in, out. in broad daylight right there it's i've ate it sparks a couple times one of the last time I was down here in New York, I yeah. ate at it. And I remember the owner, it was somebody, another steakhouse. And they were saying, had I known, you know, that hit would have given that guy this much business, I'd have drug him in front of my front door. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. but it, but the, the food is actually very oh, good. So there's a, there. was a plug for Spark Steakhouse. But, I mean, I just thought that was really brazen. Obviously, you know, hits have been committed in, in daylight before. But that was just very brazen to be on the street right there near Christmas time. Tons of innocent bystanders around, but I guess from a precision and execution standpoint, it, it went exactly how they wanted yeah. it to. Bilotti, you know, wound up being shot dead you know, in the middle of the street. Well, Bilotti had to go? Yeah, you, yeah Bilotti yeah. wasn't going to stand by yeah, after yeah, he, he just killed go. one. You had to kill yeah, both. Yeah. And the way they set it up, two people on each side of the street, so you had people coming this side for Bilotti, this side for Paul. Then, of course, John and Sammy apparently sitting right down in a car, and shooters at the other yeah, end. Yeah, there was a lot of guys on the block. Yeah, my, when my father heard about it, he said it was brilliant. I mean, you know, that's the best place, that's the best way to do it. You know, right right in front of everybody, you know, in broad daylight. I mean, my father thought it was brilliant, you know, hide in plain sight. You mm -hmm. know, to even, even to go back years and years ago, after Albert Anastasia got killed, my father's crew went on the lamb and they were trying to kill uh, Gambino. They actually were trying to kill him in Grand Central Station. I mean, what's more busy than Grand Central Station? So right. it was just a brilliant plan, and you know, and uh, and nobody, you know, was gone. That was it. They were gone. But there was a plenty of guys on the street. There was guys there to kill cops. I mean, you know, you had backup against backup against backup. Mm -hmm. But my father said it was brilliant. Well, I, there's, he's been portrayed in, like we said, both Gotti movies that we've talked about in the past. But Chaz Palminteri did play him in a movie called Boss of Bosses, yeah. which is more, you know shot from Paul's vantage point. So yeah. it does give you a little different, you know, idea of how it looks because if people just watch the Gotti movies, you have yeah. one impression. 
I'm not saying I agree with everything the boss of bosses did, but obviously Chaz himself is a phenomenal <laughs> actor. So yeah. I recommend everybody and go and, and check that out. And there's a line, and I'm paraphrasing here. I don't remember it exactly, but it's something that they said Paul said, and I'm going off what Michael Francis said on his show. He said, this life is a wonderful life if you can get away with it. Without there's just doubt. so many ways we can fuck it up. Without a doubt, yeah. And it, it fucked up again. Listen, I told this story a hundred times. When I was a kid and I got into this life, my father's partner told me to go to Washington and look at the Justice Department building before you commit to this life and just realize that that building is going to chase you your whole life. And that's just what they did. They chased me my whole life. And well, caught me a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that'll do it for yeah. this episode on Paul Castellano on Behind the Gangster. Anthony, I appreciate it, my friend. Good oh, to see you thank again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Reform Gangsters and hope to see you again soon. Have a good day.